one. The book of Acts, chapter number one, for our scripture reading. Those of you uh, who attended last week will remember that I also ask you to turn to the first chapter of the book of Acts. And I talked to us last week about what I believe to be one of the great needs of the church, and that was the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. The more I study the book of Acts, the more I understand that in the first chapter, there are some of the great truths of the Bible that need to be constantly preached. And we need to be constantly challenged by these passages of Scripture. Let me take just a minute and put it together as we move toward the first chapter of the book of Acts. There are two, bi- there are two books in the New Testament that, that indoctrinate us pertaining to the birth of our Savior. That, of course, is the gospel according to Matthew and the gospel according to Luke. Those two writers in the New Testament take us back in two or three very important directions. Number one, they take us back and identify our Savior with the first Adam. Because the Apostle Paul in the book of Corinthians and also in the book of Romans makes a distinction between the two Adams. For instance, for in the first Adam, we all fall, we all sin. But in the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, we are made righteous. The first Adam got us into trouble. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, if we yield to Him, gets us out of trouble. The first Adam is bad news. The second Adam is good news. And so Matthew and Luke take us back, trace the history, the genealogy of Jesus, back to that Adam, first Adam. But not only do they take us back to Adam, they take us back to the covenant promises in their genealogy. For instance, they talk about David. They trace the genealogy of Jesus back to him because it's through him that future prophecy will yet be fulfilled in the establishment of His kingdom here upon this earth. But even beyond that, Matthew and Luke go into great detail, and more exclusively Luke goes into great detail about the virgin birth of our Savior, because he was a physician. He understood it better than Matthew did. Then we have Mark. Mark doesn't take us into Bethlehem. Mark immediately thrusts us into the life of our Savior. In other words, Matthew and Luke said, I want to prove to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, by His genealogy, by taking you back, tying Him together to the promises. Mark said, I want to prove to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God by the things that He did. And one of the two words in the Gospel of Mark that thrust us into the life of Jesus is the word immediately or straightway. Straightway Jesus did this. Mark takes us right out there and he said, by his teachings and by his miracles, he was the Son of God. Then comes along Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke looked at Jesus uh, uh, from the standpoint that he was the Son of Man. And uh, Mark, uh, Matthew looked at him as, of course, uh, the king. Mark as the servant. Then Dr. Dr. John comes along. I like Dr. John. I like him. John was the one that leaned on the bosom, of course, of our Savior. And he teaches us that Jesus Christ, watch this closely, that Matthew and Luke talked about didn't have his beginning at Bethlehem. John says that Jesus existed from all of eternity. And he goes back and proves that when Bethlehem took place, that Jesus just came out of eternity into time. So all of those gospel writers, they present for us a unique part of the life and the ministry and the eternality of our Savior. Now, all that he accomplished in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all that he talked about, all that he promised, all that he asked the church to do, to be, and to become, then finds its fruition and finds its fulfillment 
as you begin the book of Acts. Acts is a continuation of the ministry of our Lord. Not through Him personally, but through the church of which we are a part. Acts is putting into shoe leather what Jesus taught during those years of His ministry. And in the book of Acts, we find the great doctrines of the church age that have the potential of bringing the church front and center, of establishing the church where it needs to be established. Last week, I talked in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus said, You wait until you be endued with power from on high. And after the Spirit of God comes upon you, then you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Today, there's a second aspect in Acts chapter 1 that I want to drop in our hearts for a few minutes. And I think it's one of the great doctrines of the Bible. I know it means much to me. It has spoken to me down through the years. And it's found beginning in verse number 8 and reading down where the Bible says in the first chapter of Acts, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Now, in this first chapter of the book of Acts, we have learned about the importance of the Holy Spirit. But today we learn about the importance of another great doctrinal truth. And that is the fact that we are taught here that somewhere in the history of the church age, and we, don't, we do not know where, but somewhere in the history of the church age, Jesus Christ is going to bring everything uh, to a conclusion. Jesus Christ is coming back again for His church. Now, I don't know about you. I think I do, maybe. But from my perspective, the great truth of this hour is what we call in the book of Titus, chapter number 2, the blessed hope and the soon appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Those of us that are saved today are not looking for a hole in the ground. We are looking for a hole in the sky. Those of us that are saved today, we are not looking for the Antichrist. We are looking for Jesus Christ. I hear people all the time, especially in the prophetic realm, say, we've got it figured out. We know who the Antichrist is going to be. In my lifetime, he's been uh, uh, Khrushchev. In my lifetime, uh, uh, he's been Bill Clinton, and that might be the closest thing yet. But in my lifetime, <laughs> there's been all kinds of names formulated and dropped out there in the world of prophecy. And they say, we believe this person qualifies to be the Antichrist. I've got some good news for you. If you're saved, you won't know uh, because when he appears, we will have already disappeared. The Bible said in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, that only he who letteth will now let, talking about the Holy Spirit, until he be taken out. And when the Holy Spirit is called home, those that He indwell will also be called home with Him. So we're not looking, we're not spending our time worrying about who the Antichrist is going to be. As far as I'm concerned, He can have this building when the rapture takes place. I think we could have a vote on that right now, and we could have a unanimous uh, a vote. 100% here would say He can have it. I think that you would say He can have my home mortgage. He can have it. I think you could probably say he can pay off my credit cards. <laughs> he can have it. I think you would probably say, I'm not going to be worried about what's left because when he comes, I am going out with him. And we believe that to be true. 
We believe that the redeemed of the Lord are close to going out. Now, we're not spending our time looking at signs. We're waiting for the Savior. But nevertheless, some of the things that are happening on the scene today are things that must happen before our Savior comes back for His church. I want you to understand that the last prayer in the Bible, in the 22nd chapter of the last book of the Bible, on three different occasions, uh, tells us that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming again. If you're writing a letter and you want to really emphasize something, somewhere in that letter toward the end, you're going to name it again. Maybe you named it in the first paragraph, and the purpose of that letter is going to be spelled out again before you say, Sincerely yours. Just before God had John to say, sincerely yours, uh, on the Isle of Patmos, he told him three times, surely I come quickly, behold I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. And then finally he said, surely I come quickly. And John was so overwhelmed with the anticipation and the expectation that Jesus would come again, that he stopped and he paused and he said, Even so come, Lord Jesus. I believe that is the prayer of every saved in fellowship child of God, that the Lord Jesus would come at any moment to take us out of this world. We're not looking for the funeral home. We're looking for our heavenly home. We're not anticipating death. We're, we are anticipating a transformation in the rapture of the church. Now, I want you to understand that this truth is not speculation. Somebody hasn't speculated and got all of their charts and their graphs and their pens and their books together, and they said, we speculate that the Lord might be back. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no might to it. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, this is not speculation. This is accurate information. Uh, the Bible says that he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Uh, I want you to understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, that this uh, this is not argumentation. I hear people sit around and they argue about uh, when he's coming. They say, well, you know, I believe he will come before the tribulation. I do too. I believe the Bible teaches a pre-rapture. I believe the Bible is very clear that just at any minute the trumpet could sound. As far as I know, I've studied the Bible now for many years. As far as I know, I can't find anything in the Bible. I've looked at it meticulously uh, with, a, with a magnifying glass, so to speak, for all of my life. And uh, I can't find in there anywhere where there's anything that should happen to prevent him from coming right now. I believe he could come at any minute. You may have more gas in your tank than you're going to need. If you'd known that, you wouldn't fill it up last time, would you? You may have more clothes in your closet than you're ever going to wear. The truth of the matter is, uh, before we leave this building through a physical door, we can go out through a spiritual door that's going to be open for us when Jesus Christ steps out on the clouds of glory and He calls His church home uh, and He says, Come up hither. Uh, it's not speculation. It's not argumentation. Now, uh, uh, people are arguing about, well, I think He's going to come. Books today are being written, trying to place the church uh, in the middle of the tribulation, and then the others are trying to say, we're going through. Look, look, I like what Warren Wearsby said years ago. He said uh, that we need to get off of the planning committee uh, and get on the welcoming committee. Uh, and I believe that to be true. Jesus is going, I'll tell you when he's going to come. Not in my time and not in your time and not in the theological time. Uh, he's going to come in his own time. Uh, and that's going to be good enough for me when the Lord chooses to come again. I'm looking for him to come. I got up this morning looking for him to come. As a matter of fact, I'm anticipating that he might come while I'm preaching. I don't know of a better place to go to heaven from than the church. When the church, somehow I kindly believe that maybe he will come for his church on a Sunday morning. When the dear saints have gathered together to, to worship him, wouldn't that be a wonderful time for the rapture to take place? I wonder how many would be seated here if the rapture took place. I wonder how many would be, would be heaven born if the rapture, look, it could happen. 
You say, well, I'm not sure. I've always heard that. Yeah. Peter talked about that. He said, there shall come in the latter days men walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of time and the creation. I've heard people say that. I've heard people say, oh, preacher, I've heard that all in my life. And I remind them of what Peter said. He said, there will come people that will say that. But he said, but the day of the Lord will come. And thank God it will. It's going to be a wonderful day when the rapture takes place. It's going to be, a, you're not going to take your false teeth with you. <laughs> when the rapture takes place, you're not going to take your rheumatoid arthritis with you. When the rapture takes place, you're not going to have uh, you're not going to have an organ recital. You ever get around people that <clears throat> that like to give an organ recital? Well, I had my my gallbladder removed. Uh, that's a part of that's their organ recital. Or I had my appendix, re- and they go down this list. I had this removed, and I had that removed. Look, when the rapture of the church takes place, we're not taking a corrupt body into heaven. The good news is we're taking an incorrupt body into heaven. We're not taking a weak body into heaven because the Bible says that which was sown in weakness shall be raised in power. Some glorious day may break. He that shall come will come and will not tarry. And when he comes and the trump of God sounds, uh, we're going to say, Goodbye, world, goodbye. Uh, And we're going out of this place. Uh, This world hates the Christian. This world hates the light. This world hates the church. And this world hates the Bible. And brother, we're going to get out of their way. So the only thing then they'll have left to hate each other. Uh, because we are going to heaven when the rapture of the church takes place. I've had people to argue. They say, now preacher, you know the word rapture is not in the Bible. I say, neither is the word Trinity, but I believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And the word rapture is there. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, for we shall be called up together. The word called up there is the word harpazo. It means rapture. It means to rescue from destruction. It means to transfer from one location to another location. And that's exactly what we're going to do when the trumpet sounds. We're leaving this old world and we're going to transfer out of this world, and we're going to be carried across uh, into a much better world. Uh, This world is not our home. Uh, We are just traveling through. Uh, God's got some better things laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Uh, And one of these wonderful days, or while we're sleeping at night, uh, that trump's going to sound, and we're going to leave this place, brother. We're going to be out of here for time and for eternity. It's not an argument. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I'll tell you something else. I'll tell you something else. The rapture of the church is a subject of inspiration. I'm inspired when I get up here and talk about Jesus coming. I'm inspired uh, when I can say to this church, uh, I'm inspired when I can lift up before us the fact uh, that we are not going to always be in this low land of sorrow. I'm inspired when I can say that we're going somewhere where we won't have to go stand by hospital beds uh, and watch the earthly flesh as it wastes away uh, because it's been tattered and touched by disease. Uh, I'm inspired when I think about the fact uh, that I'm not going to have to stand out in the city of the dead uh, and read a passage of Scripture about a coming resurrection uh, because on that day I'm going to be a part of that. Uh, I'm inspired when I can look to the future uh, with great anticipation knowing that this might be the terminal generation. I'm inspired over the fact that there might be at any moment an invasion from outer space when a Jew up yonder in the sky decides it's time to end this thing up and he decides to descend down here and pick us out of this low land of sorrow and transport us into his wonderful presence. I'm inspired by that. I've stood with two families of our church this week. Sister Dale's back here, and she uh, buried her brother this week. We stood out in a cemetery where the wind was blowing, and it was cold. 
And we looked out over that cemetery and we looked at that casket there with an American flag draped across the top of it uh, of someone that was precious uh, and stood there and watched as that, as that casket was placed down in the earth. Uh, I've stood yesterday over in uh, North Carolina, uh, over in the silver, silver North Carolina. Uh, with a dear family from our church uh, and help preach a funeral uh, of a dear man that just a few weeks ago sat right here on the front uh, row of this church. In fact, some 16 or 18 days ago, uh, he sat right here in the center aisle uh, of this church on the front row uh, because we had just buried his dear wife that week uh, and we had a memorial service for her. Uh, and he sat here. Uh, today, he's in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he had no idea when he said here a few Sunday nights ago uh, that at this point in time in the history of this world uh, he'd be at home in heaven. Uh, but the good news is uh, whether it's on the side of the mountains over in Silver, North Carolina uh, or whether it's in the flatlands down towards the coast uh, it makes no difference uh, whether or not it's in Germany or Japan uh, or the South American part of the world. It makes no difference where it's at. Uh, when the trumpet of God sounds uh, our Lord Jesus Christ uh, recognizes uh, and he knows all of those that knew him, he knows them by name. And thank God on that morning, he's going to call us by name. And we're going to respond. And the body's going to come forth. And those in the presence of Jesus, he's going to bring back with him. And we're going to have a meeting in the air. And we're going to have a reunion over on the other side. I'm going to see mom again. I'm going to see dad again. I'm going to see dear church members that I've buried through the years. I'm going to see dear preacher friends, uh, by the multitudes uh, who've done gone on to heaven, uh, and it doesn't seem possible uh, that they've gone. It doesn't seem possible uh, that they're no longer here. Uh, I can't call them any longer. Uh, I can't go visit them anymore. Uh, I can't sit down and get counsel from them any longer, uh, because they've done gone to heaven. Uh, oh, but one of these days, I'm going to be in that number uh, when the trumpet sounds. Uh, we're going to meet again. Uh, we're going to walk down the streets of glory again. Uh, we're going to talk about all times again. We're going to talk about bygone days. We're going to talk about what we're, what we're experiencing and what we're going to enjoy for all of eternity. This is not a dream to be awakened for. This is a reality to be enjoying because Jesus is coming again. It's not incidental. It's not accidental. But it's fundamental that Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming because He got up from this earth. He today reigns over this earth. And He's coming back to this earth. Amen and amen. I asked Trish over here a while ago, what was the doctor's report this week? Don't know yet. I asked another lady this morning, what was the doctor's report this week? Haven't heard yet. I don't know. We had in our Sunday school class people... Today, just, just numbers of people asking for special prayer requests. One in particular uh, was somebody in the hospital, and suddenly it's been determined that they have cancer in the lung. Going to have to have surgery. Others have breathing trauma. Tra Others was all kinds of sickness. I don't know about you, but I get tired of that. I'm glad that I can be a pastor to minister to people that want to be ministered to. I'm glad to go day and night. I'm glad to stand by people's bedside and pray for them. I'm glad to come to their homes and sit down and to pray for them. But I want to tell you something. Down the journey of life, you get tired. All of the time, your life consists of being with people that are losing their loved ones and, and people that you pastor that are sick. And, of course, there's a lot of other wonderful things. And I don't mean to throw that out. I'm just here telling you uh, that we're in a world. I recognize more than a lot of people uh, what sin's done to this world uh, and the degradation of the human race. Uh, and I'm looking forward uh, to the day when Jesus uh, comes and gets us out of this uh, and takes us home. Uh, and thank God uh, the former things the Bible says will be passed away. Uh, we shall be like Him. Uh, we shall have a good body. We shall have a glorified body. Uh, we shall have a body that no longer aches and pains. Thank God the rapture is going to take place. He said, now you men of Israel, you Baptists, why are you standing here gazing? 
This same Jesus which is taken up from you shall so come again in like manner as you've seen him go. You say, preacher, what about his coming? I believe his coming is imminent. Any moment, any time. The disciples of our Lord were discouraged, defeated. Now you put yourself, if you will please, in their position. They had left lucrative business and lucrative uh, possessions. Think about it for just a minute. I have no doubt that James and John were probably men of, of, of good standing financial. I have no doubt about it. But there came a day when Jesus said, follow me. And as far as the Bible is concerned, I don't see where they put up a sign and said, boats for sale. I don't read where they put up a sign, nets for sale. I don't read where they put up a sign, business for sale. All I note is when I read my Bible, Jesus came along and said, follow me, and you shall become fishers of men. And I do not see where they liquidated their assets. They just left everything idly by the seashore, and they followed the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus passed by the receipt of custom one day, and there was a man by the name of Matthew working for the Roman government. And Jesus said in so many words, I want you to come now and work for me. And he left his lucrative, and it was a lucrative position, not working for the Roman government. And he started working for the Lord Jesus Christ. There was Simon Zelotes. A very interesting character, to say the most. Uh, Simon Zelotes was a person uh, that worked against the Roman government. Now, you think about that for just a minute. He was raising up a bunch of zealots, uh, hopefully anticipating overthrowing the Roman government. Uh, think about that. Uh, Matthew worked for the government. Simon Zelotes worked against the government. But they found a common cause, uh, and they got on board with the Lord Jesus one day. Uh, others left their lucrative businesses uh, and they followed the Lord Jesus. And now he's breaking to them some bad news. He said, men, I'm going to be leaving you. But he said, I want to prepare you. I will not leave you comfortless, but I will come to you. And they got discouraged. There's no doubt about it. As you read the Gospels, you see that they're living in a state of despondency. And when Jesus met with them there in the upper room, that's the reason he quoted the 14th chapter of John. It was a word to encourage them. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Listen to this. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That must have been a day of encouragement to a group of discouraged people. Their future looked bleak. Their, their future would look black. Uh, but he said, I want you to understand two or three things. First of all, uh, I'm going, but I'm not going to leave you by yourself. Uh, I'll send the Spirit of God, uh, and He'll be with you. He will abide with you forever. Uh, but he said, secondly, I want you to understand, uh, I'm going to build some mansions in the sky. Uh, I'm going to prepare a place for you, uh, the one that paints the, the robin's breast, uh, the one that paints the sunsets and the sunrises, uh, the one that scoops out the valleys and pushes up the mountains and sends the little brooks uh, sparkling down through the valleys as they course their way uh, out to the major seas of the world. Uh, the one uh, that paints the beautiful uh, uh, landscape. Uh, the one that paints the stars at night. Uh, the one uh, that all of the universe uh, snaps to at His attention uh, because He's the upholder and the sustainer of all things. Uh, that's the person that for 2,000 years uh, has been preparing streets of glory uh, and gates of pearl. Uh, that's that's the one for 2,000 years uh, that's been fixing our house. Uh, that's the one for 2,000 years uh, that's been getting home ready for us. Uh, that's the one that's been painting it up and fixing it up uh, and preparing it for us. Uh, and Peter said, uh, we're going to a city uh, that's incorruptible uh, and undefiled, uh, and it fadeth not away, uh, and it's reserved in heaven for us. Uh, it's already there. My dad's done looked at it. Uh, my mom's done looked at my home. Uh, it's there on the streets of glory. They're there. They're safe in the arms of Jesus. No more death. No more sickness. No more suffering. No more goodbyes. They're home and they're home.
home at last and their home to stay. And one of these days out of the clouds of glory, He's going to catch us out of here. And we're going home to stay. We're going to the city that He's been preparing. We're going to the place that we can call our eternal home. Because He said to those people, people that day, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I don't need orchid to spray. It's incorruptible. Amen. Don't need to paint it. Paint it because it fadeth not away. Isn't that going to be good? I've been in some homes before where the termites had done put the knapsack on their shoulder and moved on to the next house. No termites there. I'm going to prepare a place for you. But then listen to this. He said, boys... I'll be back. And that's what he says to the church. If he wants to interrupt my plans today, even so come, Lord Jesus. Whatever he wants. Whenever he wants to come. Even so come, Lord Jesus. We believe that his coming is imminent. We believe that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is inevitable. Nothing is going to prevent him from coming. You say, well, it might be dangerous because we're shooting satellites out of space now. It won't be dangerous for him. It might be dangerous for those that oppose him, but it won't be dangerous for him. Turn in your Bibles. I've got about five sermons I'm trying to preach here all of a sudden. I can't figure out which one. I ain't even got started yet. Now, hold on. Go ahead and shift. I'm closing here just in a moment. But turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want you to see a truth. I want you to see a truth. I said His coming is inevitable. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Here's a great chapter. Great chapter. Great chapter. I want you to notice verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Talking about the coming of our Lord. Then we which are alive and remain. That's the rapture. Now it's in two aspects. There's what we call the resurrection. And there's the rapture. Now, the resurrection is for the bodies that sleep. But the rapture is for those of us that are alive when He comes. Now, the Bible says, when we which are alive and remain. Now, may this church not be like the preacher that said he, he knew that his church would be the first church out in the rapture. They said, Pastor, you don't, have, you don't know that. You don't have any Scripture for that. Oh, yes, he said, i got Scripture. He said, I know that my church will be the first church to get up in the rapture. He said, how do you know that? Because he said, the Bible says that the dead in Christ shall rise first. And he said, I've got the deadest church in the community. I know my saints will get up first. May that not be true of a Berean Baptist church. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. I call your attention to the word air. Notice where Jesus is coming to. There are two Greek words in the New Testament for air. One means the upper less dense atmosphere. The other one means the lower more dense atmosphere. The word that's used here is the word for the lower more dense atmosphere. Now why is that? You say, what? why make a big deal out of that? Because the Bible is very clear that the devil is the prince of the power of of the air. We're living in a world that is dominated and controlled by Satan. He is called the God of this age. That means the God of this world. That means that he's the one that's now working in the, the spirit of the one that's now working in the children of disobedience. And the devil is in charge of this world system. 
But when the rapture takes place, the word that's used here is that Jesus is going to come, not in the upper, less dense atmosphere. The word he's using here is that Jesus is coming into the lower, more dense atmosphere. What's that mean? The Lord is coming down in the devil's own territory, and he's going to say to the devil, step aside. The Lord's coming down in the devil's territory. And then when he gets in the devil's territory, don't you kind of think that's just to give the devil another black eye? You know the devil would like to gloat over one soul. If the devil could hold one person back that's saved, uh, it would make God a liar. Because he said that everybody that's saved is going out in the rapture. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming down in the Lord in her atmosphere. He's coming into the devil's own territory. And he's going to say, all right, devil, it's time for you to move aside. I've got work to do. I've got a church to get out. I've got a bride to bring home. There's a wedding scheduled yonder in the sky. And you might as well move aside because I'm going to take my church out. And in the devil's territory, he's going to say, come up hither. And every grave, every molecule of every saved person is going to formulate, is going to come together. Uh, and in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, right in the devil's territory, while he's standing back watching, saying, Capro, I can't handle it any longer. Uh, in his own territory, he's going to be a defeated foe again because Jesus is going to take us out of this lowland of sorrows right through the devil's territory into the presence of the Father's house. Oh. And that's going to be an excedrin headache day for the devil. And that's going to be a glorious resurrection day for the child of God. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, watch it, shall so come again. As you've seen him go. When? It's imminent. Right now. Now tell you, let, me, let me close out with the tragedy of it. I'm finished. Jesus spoke in parable, said this. Two men shall be in the bed. One shall be taken. One left. Two women shall be grinding at the, fee, at the meal. One shall be taken, one shall be left. Two men shall be in the field. One shall be taken, and one shall be left. What does it mean? It means that someday the husband is going to come home. And while he's getting out of his car, he's not aware of the fact that the rapture is taking place. And he's going to go in the house, and he's going to say his wife's name as he walks through the door, but she's not going to respond. He's going to call his children. He's going to call the neighbors. But some of the phones are not going to be ringing. Why? Because the rapture will have taken place. He's left behind. And she's taken to heaven because two shall be grinding at the meal. One shall be taken. One shall be left. Mother's going to get up early in the morning to go in the room where her little baby is lying in the bed. To make sure that the little baby has slept safely through the night. And she's going to look down in the bassinet, but there's going to be a blanket and a mattress. But don't look like the baby's there. And she's going to jerk the, 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 little, the, the little blanket back, only to find an empty bed. Why? Because while they slept unprepared, the little baby was raptured out and taken into the presence of the Lord Jesus. I like to think about people in an assembly plant. Here's people over at Ford Motor Company putting a Ford together. This person here has the responsibility of putting the fenders on the car as it comes down the line. And later on down the line, they look up and here comes a bunch of cars that don't have any fenders on them. And they start checking around and they say, well, the guys that put the fenders on, evidently they've gone on break. We can't find them. And they check around, and they can't be found. Why? Because like Enoch of old, he was translated. 
He was taken across into the presence of the Lord. The next time you fly on an airplane, you better make sure that you're saved. Because if the rapture takes place and the pilot's saved, the plane will be pilotless. You better make sure you're saved when you're driving down the road because the people that you're meeting on the road that are saved are going to be out of an unmanned vehicle when the rapture takes place. There's never been a time in the history of the world when there's going to be so much pandemonium as when the rapture takes place. Some liberal preacher across this country is going to go to church on Sunday morning. Wonder where all of his people's at. Because some of the dear old saints of God that remember it the way it used to be won't be found. And he'll come as a lost minister to stand up to preach to a few lost people left behind because the people that were saved were taken out in the rapture and they're no longer on planet Earth. You say, preacher, that sounds like something that Alfred Hitchcock came up with. No, 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 no. This is not fantasy. This is reality. This might be the day. The next time I meet some of you folks, it may be as we go up. It may not be here tonight. Because Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord will come. And we're supposed to live before Him that we would not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Because as we live, so will the rapture find us. I heard a preacher years ago preaching on this subject, and he had a high rail across the front of the church. He's preaching on the rapture, and he said it's going to be like this. And he ducked down. The choir wasn't behind him, and he ducked down and disappeared behind the pulpit. And what they didn't know was he crawled out past that rail, went out to the side place in the choir, and went around the building. Everybody's waiting for the preacher to come up again. Preachers disappear. He went around the building and came in the front of the church and he said, The Lord's coming! And it scared them like it scared some of you just then. That's the way it's going to be. There won't be a countdown in Houston. When the Lord Jesus decides to come, it'll be over with. Before you can do that, because the Bible says he's coming in the twinkling of an eye. He's coming in a moment. Very interesting word. A time or space so small that it cannot be calculated. If you're not ready, you will be left. Man, I want you to know you're going. I want the Berean Baptist Church to show up in glory. If you don't know him today... I strongly advise you get to know Him. Because Jesus, hallelujah, is coming again. They said it in Acts 1. He's coming. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Our eyes closed. I want to ask you today, are you ready? Are you ready? Is your life in accord with the coming of Jesus? Let me ask you this. Are you looking for Him to come? Let me ask you this. Do you have a desire for Him to come? Let me ask you this. Are you ready for Him to come? If not, you can get ready. I wonder if you're here today and you'd say by an upraised hand, I'm glad for this truth, but I'd have to say right now, I'd be ashamed before Him if He should come right now. And I want you to pray for me. There's some things in my life that I need to correct. Please pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Please pray for me. I see these hands all over the building. I wonder if there'd be one here today and you'd say, I'm unsaved. And I know if the Lord should come, I'd be left behind. And I'm concerned about my salvation. I'm concerned about my soul. Please pray for me. Is there one? Yes, I thank you. I see your hand. Is there another? 
I'm not ready for the coming of the Lord. If he should come, I would probably be left behind. Pastor, pray for me. Would you slip someone else? Thank you. Heavenly Father, I pray for these. In Jesus' name, I lift them up before you. I pray in Jesus' name that you'll help this to be preparation time. Lord, for those today who said there's some things that's wrong that needs to be righted, I pray today that you'll help them to find their way to this altar. Lord, I pray for the, the hand today that said, I'm not ready. I'm, I, I, if the rapture took place, I wouldn't get to go. I pray that you'll help that individual and others to find their way to this altar and let some dear precious soul guide them into the family of God through the Word of God. Speak to our hearts. Help us to get ready. Help us to be ready. And help us to live in the expectation of the blessed hope. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Our heads are still bowed. I want to ask you to do this. You're not doing this for me. You're doing this for you. Because the rapture could take place at any moment. First of all, if you said, I've never been saved, I do not believe I'd be ready if the rapture should take place. I want to ask you to do this while we're playing on the musical instruments. I want to ask you just to step out and come. Somebody will meet you here. Take the Bible and show you how you can be saved, how you can know you're ready to meet the Lord. Just step out right now. Don't wait for somebody else. You just come on right now. Just take the step. Come on right now. Let us pray with you. Secondly, you said there's things that's wrong that needs to be righted. You don't want those things to be in your life if the rapture took place today. You can do something about it right now. The Lord will forgive you. Would you step out? Come on down here right now and let's pray. Bring your need to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the Spirit of God guide you to come to this altar as He has already guided you to raise your hand. You have acknowledged that there's a need. You don't want to take a chance on the rapture taking place and you not being right with God and have to face that. We're singing this stanza for those others that need to come. Would you come right now as we sing this stanza together? Come on, let's come.